<laughs> Everyone loves milk. Who doesn't love milk? <laughs> Apart from people that lactose and tolerance, actually, they can't actually have milk. Um, yes, guys, welcome back to the Canon Podcast. And today we are here after a stupendous victory against West Ham. Who put the ball in the West Ham net? Well, half our team did. Um, anyways, guys, Alex, George, how, how? let's go to Alex first. Alex, how are you feeling after that? Fantastic, oh, sensational man. victory. Declan Rice stagger, 6-0. West Ham fans are crying, Arsenal fans are laughing. It's amazing, isn't it? It was unbelievable, but I can see too many smiles on my screen currently. And oh, I hope dude. neither of you I hope neither of you have been celebrating for the last the celebration like, what do we say? What, what do we say on instant reaction? A small fist bump. That's that's <laughs> that's what we're allowed. No, mate, it's been it's been amazing. Look, I think, you know, what what I love in these uh, post these types of wins is you start hearing those vict- those those sort of stats that are like you know it was West Ham's biggest home defeat since 1963 and or, or, or like Arsenal's biggest away win under Arteta so, so on and so forth you start hearing all of those um, those sorts of stats and it's just so fun I think look we we get so caught up in the, the the sort of shape of the season what does this mean for the title race where do we compare with Liverpool and City. Not to sound like Rio Ferdinand, but just enjoy it, man. Just enjoy it. It's it's so good. It's so good. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to chatting about it because I think there's 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 a lot to unpack. But headline, yeah, great performance. There's a lot to unpack for sure. And I think I'll go to the tactician first and George. George, let's talk about something that you've spoken about in the past. Benny Blanco playing a bit more inverted, a bit more midfield. What did you make mm. of his performance? I thought it was an interesting one because I, I feel like he, that's the one position that we haven't seen, even though he's probably the most suited to it. You know, when you're kind of discussing, um, you know, Ben White as a whole, the whole issue was people thought they saw a center back. Then we've transitioned him to fullback, which is something I always felt he could do because of his crossing variety and his running power. But in terms of his ability to invert from the right hand side, if you really think about it, it solves quite a bit of his weaknesses. In terms of defending out wide 1v1, you no longer have that responsibility. In terms of his ability to kind of still maintain that crossing variety, he has that. He has the ability to overlap if there if the situation arises, but he's not doing it constantly every match. So you're not talking about a Ben White that maybe is tired throughout the season. You're definitely talking about a more sustainable role for Ben White. And I also just think his passing range is something that we haven't exploited enough And I think sometimes he's a lot more technical and I'm a lot harsher on Ben White than I am on other players because too many times I find his release from the back line to be a hit and hope when I know he can hit people a lot more accurately than I think he does. And I think by going in the middle of the park, I think it it allows us to maybe make use more of his technical qualities, especially finding people between the lines because he's got brilliant passing ranges and, you know, the switch from right to left is... um, probably one of the most accurate in the squad if we keep using it well. And we haven't seen it really since his center back sample. So uh, I'm looking at this as a way to not only provide some rest, but also I look at Bakayo Saka in terms of what the impact has on the right-hand side when you've got an inverted fullback down there. Get Saka wide, but I think against a team that had real big issues with their fullback and center back channels, that makes sense. It makes sense to have a little bit more threat on the one side so that you drag out your poor defenders out wide. And I think that's what worked in this isolated game. And it's just an example of us being flexible. Like, I don't think last season we're sitting there thinking that Mikel is willingly able to do an inverted role switch and trust Kivior to play the alternate fullback role despite injuries. And I think injuries, you do have to, you know, put your hat on and say, listen, they forced his hand a bit because, you know, Zinchenko's out with a calf strain and, you know, his preferred maybe fullback pairing aren't there. But still, I feel that it was, for once, a really proactive difference. And it caused a lot of differences, not just in Ben White's role, it caused differences in Saliba's role, his ability to overlap from deep, which I thought was brilliant. Those carries were phenomenal, something that we haven't seen since his loan at Marseille. Um, And we know he can do. Um, And I think that also we saw Gabriel central center back, which is another thing that since preseason, I don't think, you know, he had the best sample down there, but he certainly has grown into the role because he's technically been phenomenal this season. And I think if we're able to create these new roles for players that we already agree are world class at their plan A, then I just think that it makes you a very unpredictable team. It makes you a team that mid-game we can maybe perform this switch 
um, you know, when uh, whenever the opposition asks for it. And yeah. that's the flexibility that I think Mikel has wanted since the start of the season. I think I like the fact that Mikel is adaptable now. I definitely like the fact that instead of adapting to his, towards the system, it's always, okay, who's available now? How can I play to the best strengths? And knowing that Kivio is not as comfortable as Ben White and Verting, it's, it's a positive. And I think Alex talked about it as well. The fact that a lot of things that people were demanding from Mikel, he is now giving them. Subs, you know, most sub goes off the bench. The squad's being rotated well. I like the fact that our players aren't cold that are coming off the bench anymore. The likes of Nelson and Ketia, Kivio, they've all got minutes across the season. So now, as we enter the tough parts, these guys are ready to dump straight into the first team. And, you know, I look at Ben White's performance and I'm going, you know, Alex, do you reckon that John Stones prototype, like we saw in the Champions League final, obviously I think Stones is a better player, but that type, type of profile, could Ben White maybe do that for Arsenal maybe in the longer term? I think this is one of the reasons we on this podcast, but also generally, I think people I like in the football space always talk about sort of role and profile over position and going, you know, and, and instead of putting people in, well, he's a right back, he's a left back, he's a whatever, that, that's what all he can do. Start to look at what is the profile of the player? What can he actually, what can he bring? What could what could he be projecting forward? Those are always, for me, the more interesting and, and, and fruitful conversations. And George kind of alluded to it, you know, what what is Ben White's, Probably what's the biggest weakness, maybe most obvious weakness that we've seen from Ben White and Arsenal shirt, and it is defending out wide 1v1 against certain wingers. It's not it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean we can't play him there. It doesn't mean, you know, whatever, but it means in certain games we have to say, okay, does Saliba slightly position himself differently? Is he a little bit more conservative? Does he does he is he the one who steps out? Well, you know, just little adjustments. Every player has their has their weaknesses and, and, and strengths, and it's about sort of adapting to them. But we've sort of seen him in that right back role and we've gone, well, Ben White's our right back now. And I think we know from, you know, we don't want to sort of uh, elongate the, the, the Pep uh, comparisons for too long, but we know from from Pep's football um, and we've started to see from Mikel's football that players are going to move around, they are going to change and it's based on their profile as a, as a player. And I think Ben White, in terms of stopping, um, sort of defending centrally, as George was sort of alluding to, he is really, really special at defending centrally, which means he could step forward. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean he, he has to play as a six? Not necessarily. Could mean that. Does it mean he has to play as a centre-back? Not necessarily. Could mean that. Does it mean he has to play as a right-back? Not necessarily. And, and also, a six and a centre-back and a right-back in an Arteta system is very different from a six, a centre-back and a right-back in a, a Klopp system or a Neil Warnock system. You know, it is all, all very different. So, I think if we look at the profile, there is someone who could be very special defending sort of centrally. I think as someone who, um, you know, we've seen can go on the overlap. Do I think that overlap is the long-term future for Ben White? I don't know. I remember that game and you you guys will probably remember it better than me. There was a game where Martinelli was finding space this season on the left-hand side and Ben White had a number of switches out to him which were really accurate. George is nodding. I can't remember the game if you could help me. George, what was the, the game? game? What was it? Is it, it Fulham? I, re I remember, well, it wasn't even it this, Fulham at home? this season. I, I've seen him from his center back days, that David Luiz esque yeah. switch, it, it, he has very consistent ball striking for me in longer distances. And you know, I, th I, th I think it was I think it was Fulham at home. I think I could be wrong, and I'm sure someone will correct me. But yeah, yeah, I I, I think the the David Luiz comparison is good. Um, I think there's a there's a springiness to him that when he's fresh could be exploited in terms of stepping up and 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 stopping transitions early. So everything is there for a central role. I don't see the John Stones comparison in terms of that sort of advancement forward with the ball carrying. But again, players hmm, develop. Interesting. Players develop. G -G, um, uh, and we'll see. I always find that intriguing because if you go back to Ben White's early days at Arsenal, we loved that dribbling. Leeds. That's what it was. Go back to Leeds. Yeah, even, you're right, even at Leeds, um, those bursting runs forwards of that game against Villa at the Emirates where we were beaten 3 0 years ago or 3 1, where he just burst through the half of the team. I definitely think he has it in his locker. I mean, Stones is obviously world-class at what he does, but I'm looking at Ben White's profile and I'm going, this guy has a lot of the things Stones does have and he could match it in I that think, sense as well. I think the reason I don't see that is partly because I haven't seen it in Arsenal shirt for a long time, which you know is 100% part of my thinking, but also because I think at Leeds, as far as I remember from, from, from the things you're referring to, it was from a wide area and kind of not unpredictable but from a, he had, it was given a little bit more freedom on the ball. If Arteta gives him freedom on the ball and he's allowed to go and do that, fine. But I look at the likes of Timber, I look at the likes of Zinchenko, I look at the likes of Declan Rice, and I say, and Smith Rowe, and I say, if you're ch uh, charging or tasking someone in this Arsenal team to go and do that for you and carry the ball through the centre of the park, I'm not saying Ben White can't do it, 
but why would you make it Ben White? I, I, I think he has better qualities behind the ball. I think he has better qualities mm. tr- stopping transitions. But again, players develop. And look, what is he? He's still 25, 26. You know, he might d- develop a, a different part of his game that, that excites me and surprises me. And, and I, I would not put it past him to do that. I think it's, it's a very good point you make as well White. about Timber. Go on, George. Yeah, I think, I think it's important for Ben White to develop like this, by the way, because I can see that, that that's going to be the demands of the squad. And personally... We've said, for example, Kai Havertz's role this season from what you see in an Arsenal shirt is not going to be his role next season. We've seen plenty of roles evolve in the team. And I think that personally, and I'm predicting right now, um, I believe that we're going to see less people in the back line. And we're going to see more people in forward areas. We're going to commit more yes. uh, players forward. Attack. We're going to see a rest defense that has more of four players as opposed to five typically now when people view the team in very basic terms i'm not even going to speak in complex quote-unquote tactico you have five people defending no zone 14s bro. Attacking. <laughs> yeah. I hate well, but we do have a, we have so a special much. coming we have a special tactical a to z on the patreon and youtube membership side <laughs> Ooh, little <laughs> plug cheeky cheeky little plug <laughs> he's done this before but uh, i think like yeah you just have five people attacking and five people defending for me personally, I think the team is going to become so good, and it has become so good um, at sustaining pressure and touches in the box. I think there's something like 900 and something touches in the box, whereas the next best person in the league is at like 800 and low 800s. So Arsenal are significantly the best team at sustaining pressure in the league, and I think that that's just going to become better. And once you have that, you've got the defenders behind you to trust and to gamble and that gamble is what's going to be needed to break down these low blocks more consistently you know i think west ham are maybe a poor example of what we're going to expect to face in the future because i think west ham had a really horrid job in midfield i'm sure we'll get to that game and that analysis but as a whole i feel that arsenal need to gamble more in midfield they need to allow more freedom in terms of the passing in terms of the carrying, in terms of finding people between the lines, because we have the players, for me, that can turn in those tight spaces. But getting the ball to these players more frequently enough is something that this season we have struggled with up until, I'd say, November. From November onwards, we have been the most creative team in the league. Keep repeating it. I think this run is not unpredictable. It makes sense. But part of that, to loop it back, is making sure that you're giving freedom to all your players. And one of that, for me at least, is Ben White. He represents a Maverick player. I think that Saliba, by the way, has the potential to represent more Maverick, quote end quote, in him. We have not seen the ball carrying from Saliba that we know he has. We know we've seen in Marseille. These are things that I think we can predict and project outwards that we can ask these players to do because they've got that running power. Um, to really exploit that through the middle of the park. And that's something that we need to see. Um, if, we're, if we're going to have teams that are going to block the center, right? It's, a, it's, about, yeah. it's about coaxing people out of their comfort zone. And one of, you, mm-hmm. the, one of the ways you do that is through carries. You can do it through passing. Um, I think that carries offer a different level of um, unpredictability. They force your mm-hmm. opposition to meet you, get you out of your block. At least with a pass, there is a, an argument that in theory you can structure a team to cut off passing lanes to ensure that even with quick switches, you're able to at least shuttle across and keep your lines compact. But once you add a dribbler, a hazard, an Iniesta, and I'm not comparing Ben White to that, but you add that unpredictable dribbling quality into the middle of the park, you force teams and markers to step out to meet you. And that's what destroys plans. As a coach, I always go on and I look at the opposition and I say, which one of these guys can carry it into areas that I don't want them to? Because those are the those are the types of players that can destroy structure. I look at Young Ming Sun, brilliant ball striker, but he annoys me because he's a effective dribbler that constantly causes doubt in a in a back line. I, I look at even these poor teams in terms of Marcus Rashford. I I think he's a very effective dribbler. And when you look at it, that's their biggest threat when United are on top. He is good. And I look at Arsenal. When we are on top, who is good? Jesus, Saka, the Mavericks that are unpredictable but effective ball carriers. And I think, to tie this little segment off, 
Pep has shown you with his recruitment. What did he recruit in midfield with his rebuild? He didn't recruit more Ilkay Gundogans. He recruited Kovacic, Mateus Nunez, Doku. There was a level of ball carrying that he transitioned to, and I just think that's going to become a lot more important in the modern game. I, I agree, I agree. And I think Maverick profiles is something that I think also could add more to, but we talk about creating. There's a lot, there's a lot of ways to create chances. One way is Martin Odegaard, and he's been outstanding at it recently. So let's talk about Martin Odegaard, because I think it's very important. We were speaking about him early in the season. There was a lot of issues, problems. How do we fix him? How do we solve him? Right now, Alex, I mean, he's playing at a different level, different gravy. <laughs> different gravy what was that stat that came out is that the most creative person ever or something I can't remember what it was yeah I agree it was an unbelievable stat let me try and find it it's uh, 50 yeah, here, chances here created is. first yeah go on so against West Ham he created 7 chances and provided 2 assists becoming the first player in Europe's top 7 leagues to create 50 plus chances from open play this season the Arsenal captain also ranks first for successful passes into the penalty box and through balls played across Europe's top 7 divisions jeez good play isn't he decent no yeah I I was, uh, he's not bad. He's not bad. Yeah. Um, the uh, also too many flicks, though. A few too many. A few too many gobs in the in the hand, and then running it through the hair. Well, he stopped. Apparently, he stopped. Uh, someone's point this out. So he stopped doing the thing where he, he pulls his socks up at the because uh, the they're clocked. So he's saying the he Oh, yeah. here we go. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, he, he. I think. I think this is. I, I actually saw something yesterday about you know how oh, Arsenal heritage is having a brilliant playmaker at all times. So was it Bergkamp, Fabregas, Özil, now Erdegaard? I, I'm slightly allergic to calling Erdegaard a playmaker because he is. That's a hundred percent what he is. But he's more. He is more than that. Like, and I think, and maybe this is me, possibly overrating the player. But I think like, yes, Erdegaard has all of that the brilliance to him, the, the sort of the, the final ball, he has that ability to, you know, to pull those kind of Traveller passes out in, in a way you don't, you couldn't even see. Yes, he has the ability, you know, and actually something we were doing a lot yesterday is playing that ball to the back stick, um, perfectly weighted. He has he has all that as locker. I don't think he has it quite to the level of, let's say, a Meza Ozil, who was a, a, a true 10. Um, but I think he, he, you know, he's certainly getting there. But I think what Erdegaard has is this incredible work rate incredible and and that that's what makes him an Arteta player and that's what to me makes him an all-round number eight he is a midfielder he is someone who who when you're in the final third he's your primary playmaker or one of your primary playmakers uh, you know it depends how you define chances but also when you're out of possession he's your midfielder he's your number eight he's doing your shuttling work he's leading the press if you if you just watch Martin Erdegaard the amount this guy runs, the amount this guy organises the press, the amount this guy blocks off passing lanes, the amount this guy's communicating, the amount he's creating for Arsenal in different ways in terms of, of, of situations or, or being the wall pass or being the person who sacrifices himself out wide. Martin Odegaard isn't making himself the creative hub of the team on purpose. This guy is doing exactly what the game requires. I did a um, an unpopular opinions thing on Different Not recently, plug. Two blocks. Um, and uh, and someone said, oh, the team's going to move on from Martin Erdegaard. And I was like, that is the perfect example of not seeing the va- not seeing what this guy does. Because if you just look at him as a playmaker, you could probably, if you wanted to, there might be like, you look at like a couple other players in the world who are better playmakers. You probably look at like Kevin De Bruyne as a pure, if you're just taking that stat, let's say final ball, crosses from the half space, uh, through balls, all that sort of stuff. I'd argue, let's stick Erdogan on the team with, with with Haaland and see what happens. But, you know, fair enough. You could say there's probably better final ball merchants and assist merchants. But in terms of overall midfielders, if, if that's what we're going to judge Martin Erdogan by, as a number eight, in terms of what we think of as a number eight in all phases, the ability to drop back and take it off the first line, the ability to carry, the ability to, to create those triangles wide, whatever the game needs, he does it. And I think we need to stop think, thinking of him, and you know, I'm sure we spoke about this on the pod, stop thinking about him in the sort of the Ozil, Kevin De Bruyne, maybe that's a bad, bad example, but certainly Ozil, Fabregas, Bergkamp kind of conversation. Yes, he can sort of do that, but he's so much more. Mm-hmm. He, he's a very complete player but George I, I, I think before you speak about him I've got someone else that I want you to talk about instead mm. Ethan Guanieri off the bench yesterday <laughs> put in a fantastic performance didn't he I mean it wasn't electric but it was very very impressive for someone who's 16 years of age and I think at 16 years of age enter this elite Arsenal side and do that bit, bit special kid isn't he thanks for checking out the Canon Podcast 
To hear the full episode, sign up as a YouTube member on this channel or go to patreon.com forward slash thecanonpod.